and co-director and co-director of the project in brain science and global law and policy. Dr. Giordano is also senior bioethicist of the Defense Medical Ethics Center and an adjunct professor of psychiatry at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. He is distinguished visiting professor of science, health promotions, and ethics at the Coburg University of Applied Science in Coburg, Germany, chair emeritus of the neuroethics program of the IEEE Brain Initiative, and served as a senior fellow of the EU Human Brain Project. He's authored uh, of over 350 publications, 10 books, 50 governmental reports on neuroscience, ethics, and global health and security. He's an elected member of the European Academy of Science and Arts and an international fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. He was a member of this year's World Championship Program Committee and will be one of the four judges in our live judging sessions on Friday. Um, his talk today is Bold New Brain Science, Brave New Bioethics, and we look forward to hearing it. Thank you, Dr. Giordano, for being here. I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a very, very kind and gracious introduction. And, you know, for, for all the scholars who are listening in, I mean, what that basically means is I've been doing this for four decades. I mean, it's just not any great accomplishment. It's just that I've been at it for a long time. And I tell you that not simply to sort of say, hey, I'm an old guy talking to you, but because I got into the field of neuroscience back in oh late 1970s, early 1980s. And when I got into the field, there were only four, four programs that were titularly called the neuroscience programs. It was one at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. There was the prototypic program by Eric Kandel and James Schwartz at Columbia University in New York City. There was one at Princeton University, and it was one on the other coast at Stanford. And these are all great programs, neuroscience programs. And I was very excited about what I saw as this newly developing field, because coming out of my high school and getting into the collegiate years, I was thinking, this is really cool stuff. But I, I tell you that for another reason, because here we are some, what, 40 years later. And 40 odd years later, what we're seeing is that there are literally hundreds of academic programs devoted particularly to the neurosciences just here in the United States. We have to recognize that the brain sciences are ever more a multinational enterprise. And, and as a consequence of that, we're seeing ever more educational programs at a variety of levels, not just at four-year colleges and multi-year universities, but also at two-year colleges, increasingly high school programs. And there are more and more dedicated philanthropic freestanding institutes, programs and projects that are focused on varying areas of the neurosciences. And the neurosciences, ladies and gentlemen, are not a monolithic entity. They're not a single field. Under that broad rubric of the brain sciences, we have a range of approaches that range from literally the subcellular molecular neurosciences all the way to the social. How it is that those organisms that have a brain, but perhaps engage their brain functions as what we would colloquially refer to as a mind, get along with each other and get along with other species and basically just get along in their various environments and what it takes to do that. Now, now understand that the broad swath of that application allows the brain sciences to be focused on individual health, well-being, survival, and flourishing, as well as international health, well-being, survival, and flourishing. And it's that combination of the idiosyncratic, the individual to the systemic, that gives the brain sciences, if you will, much of their credibility and clout. Uh, but let me temper this discussion, if I could, just to give you some importance of how the brain sciences came to be and perhaps where the brain sciences are going. You know, although the titular fields of neuroscience are just about 40 years in their generation and their sustainability, that doesn't mean that studies of the brain are only 40 years old. I don't know, very much to the contrary. You know, I can imagine some prototypic humanoid first looking into a reflecting pool literally hundreds of thousands of years ago, as we first sort of stood upright, perhaps, and recognized that there was something different about what made us, us. And that initial recognition that that thing that was looking back at us in that reflecting pool was us. Well, perhaps that was the spark. See, well, what makes us different? How is it that I recognize me? And, you know, that analogy holds over the thousands of years of human anthropological, sociological, biopsychosocial history. 
I think in many ways, what we really see is what the brain sciences provide us with is not just a lens to look into the brain, but a mirror. We can turn around and look back at ourselves. And I think much of that derives from the initial mirror reflection that the brain sciences offered us. I mean, looking in that reflecting pool, recognizing that was me looking back at myself, asks me to question, what is the nature of the meanness of me? What makes me me? I mean, if we take then centuries long jumps forward into that future from that reflecting pool, perhaps to the long libraries of the Middle Ages and Renaissance, we come to the historian, scholar and mathematician polymath, René Descartes, who in his cogito pondered, I think, therefore I am. But the flip side of that is, well, how is it that I think? And these foci on what makes us think, how we think about things that think, ultimately derived from the philosophical musings into the proto-psychological musings of the late 19th century in Germany and elsewhere, that then developed ever more into the biological sciences as we moved into the 20th century. And of course, moving through the 20th century, arguably one of the scientific advancements is those tools that we've developed to study the brain and what it does. But understand that interesting relationship that exists by the tools we have and the knowledge we get. You know, the tasks that we want to do are before us. And very often, we use the tools we have at our disposal, tools of our observation, tools of our senses, tools of our rationality to explore these things. But then we get to the limits of those tools' capabilities, and then the tasks remain and perhaps become ever more complicated. So the task then is challenged back to us to build ever more sophisticated, more capable, more granular and complicated tools. And that's what the brain sciences are doing. They're building tools that are ever more capable to be able to assess the brain, access the brain, and affect the brain. Now, let's hold that thought for a moment because. The other interesting concept that occurs is as we develop ever newer tools, we characteristically develop ever newer theories. And we come to the limits of those theories and we recognize that very often the borders of those theories are constrained by the toolkits we have and thus we develop ever newer tools. But indeed humans are tool users, not just to acquire knowledge. And I would, I would argue, and I think defensively to each and all of you, that even our simple tools of observation and assessment are used for more. Rarely do we accumulate knowledge just for its own sake. We put that knowledge to work as a tool to build new tools and to understand the world ever more deeply, more complexly, and in those ways, perhaps affect that world. Increasingly, we're turning that lens back into ourselves and the world that we look to affect is not our environments that are quote, out there, but our environments that are in here, inclusive of in here. That way, the brain becomes a bold new final frontier. You know, it, it's funny because there's a wonderful book by the Nobel laureate, Dr. Gerald Edelman. And Edelman actually was an immunologist and won the, the Nobel Prize for his ongoing work in immunology, but became a neuroscientist later in his career because he recognized the, the communicative capacities that we see between the immunological sciences and the neurosciences, that they both do something quite similar. They're, they're both, if you will, systems of relationality. Our immune system relates what is us to not us, what is interiority to exteriority, and so does our neurological system. And just like the immune system, our neurological system works something like a time and space machine. It relates our past experiences, memories, and the consequences that our experiences and actions have generated to our present, matches them to that sample of the past so as to be able to think about, predict, decide upon what actions we may take in the future. It was not an accident that Jerry Edelman rolled from immunology into neurosciences, but in exploring the brain sciences, what Dr. Edelman saw before him was that the brain itself, in its myriad functions, in its myriad connectivities, in its structure, on a variety of scales, from the infinitesimally small to the entirety of the brain that is embodied in the individual who is embedded in their reality, seems to be, to paraphrase Emily Dickinson, 
wider than the sky, a universe within. <laughs> Realistically, that conjures up thoughts of Captain Kirk, Starship Enterprise, space, the final frontier. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's space? This space. Because this is the space that allowed us as a species to venture into space. This is the space and its workings that allowed us to ponder what it means, perhaps to exist in space on a planet in our galaxy, in a universe, perhaps among universes. This is the space that allows us to appreciate time, not only our own experiential time, and what that means for me personally, but our historical time and what that may mean for us collectively. And now, unless you've been living under a rock, this is the space that also ponders whether or not we're alone in the universe or not, and what that means for us, for them, for our past, for our, our future, and what that may also mean for the development of our brains, and what that may mean for the development of the tools that allow us to take those brains across space and time, not only as a function of our minds, thinking into our memories and planning our futures, but perhaps literally. But what does that also tell us about connectedness? Our connectedness with each other as, as human beings, our connectedness with the stuff, with the stars, to paraphrase the late Carl Sagan. Well, it, interestingly, those discussions are not esoteric. These are some of the discussions that neuroscientists are now having because we're learning more and more about the fabric of the universe. Part of that universe is the universe within. We're understanding that it may very well be that the universe itself is a quantum system, a quantum structure, and that the very activity of quantum structures and quantum functions, inclusive of things that seem to be quirky like entanglement, communication over long distances almost immediately in time, may have some preserved function in the essence of the structures of our brains. Are we a form of quantum computer, or are we some type of computational structure that engages perhaps quantum operations that are translated into the mechanical scale? We don't know yet. And this brings us, ladies and gentlemen, face to face with what the cognitive scientist and philosopher David Chalmers has referred to as the hard question of the brain sciences. Despite the fact that we've been pondering our own ponderance for, if you will, at least hundreds, if not thousands of years in some form or another, and have harnessed our ever budding, ever advancing and iterative technologies for certainly the past hundred years with ever more innovative, intuitive, inventive, and in some ways interventional means over the past four decades. There are still answers to those profound questions of the brain sciences that remain elusive to us. The hardest one, the one that looms large, literally on every horizon of neuroscientific investigation is, how does mind occur in brain? We don't know. Look, let's face it, if someone were to put a gun in my ear and say to me, Jim, how does that happen? I'd have to tell them, pull the trigger. I don't know. And it's not because I personally don't know, because there's something deficit to my knowledge of the brain science is that we in the community of the brain sciences simply do not know how the great stuff of our consciousness, of our thoughts, of our emotions, of our memories, of our loves, of our hates, of our planning, of our abstractions, of our transcendental ideas that allow us to travel great distances in our mind to the edges of the universe and to the infinitesimally small domains of the molecule and subatomic realm. We have no idea how those great things occur in the gray stuff of these soupy, sparky cells that live in our heads. Nor do we really know if, in fact, other organisms, despite the fact that their brains may be different than ours, have similar, if not even perhaps more advanced capabilities than we do. Uh, we tend to think very anthropocentrically. You know, we, we think that we're on the top of these, this sort of biological ziggurat or totem pole. But let's face it, we're now learning ever more that a variety of different creatures that have what appear to be relatively simple nervous systems and do some very, very complicated things. And it doesn't take a lot of brain cells to do something really super. It takes the structural, functional integrity of those cells 
the nodes and network connectivities and the reciprocal connections that exist, perhaps that are able to entertain functions that human brains can, but on a different level. Doing so not just homologously, in other words, one-to-one -one the way we do, but analogous, neural-like, which then brings us squarely into a contemporary definition of that prefix neuro. You know, over the past 10 years, our research group here at Georgetown has been flirting with what that word actually means, because more and more we're seeing is that word is being used as a, a prefix. Uh, we see it in neuroethics, for example, something we'll talk about momentarily. Neurophilosophy, neuro law, neurosociology, neuroeconomics, neuro marketing. What does the neuro mean there? Does it really confer some certainty that we know how marketing or economics or law occurs in the brain? No, it doesn't. What it actually does is it communicates what we know about the brain sciences and what we don't know about the brain sciences. And in those ways, that neuro prefix, ladies and gentlemen, prompts, if not compels, if not obligates us to come face to face with two very important questions. What do we do with the tools and the knowledge we have? And what do we do about the tools and the knowledge we don't? Well, in many ways, what that then does is harken us back to Chalmers' hard question. Do we need to answer that question? Do we need to know how the great stuff of our consciousness, our cognitions, our feelings, our hopes, our dreams, our memories, our plans actually occur in the material thing that is the brain? Maybe not. Because one of the things that the brain science has become very, very good at doing is functioning as a science of correlation, not necessarily causality. In other words, if we develop a large enough repository of data about structural functional relationships in the brain, this is the pattern of brain node and network activity that seems to be involved, if not directly subserving things like our various thoughts, our emotions, our plans, our dreams, pain. Happiness, sorrow, anxiety, fear, love, hate. Well, could we then not only create brain maps, but use those maps as targets? Targets for our tools of intervention to be able to now intervene in the brain, to be able to engage those nodes and networks that become differentially active so as to modulate their functions change their capabilities, and in so doing, essentially change our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. Well, I think the low-hanging fruit to that question that needs to be picked is, yeah, we can, but for what? What are we going to do with it? Well, we'd like to think, and certainly I would argue, and, and I think I would be correct in my argument, that the basic intent of the brain sciences and their technologies to be used for good, to be used to diagnose disorders, conditions, problems that create the human predicament of our suffering, the burdens of our life, and perhaps in some way impede our survivability, our quality of life. But more than that, perhaps, answering what makes us us, addressing questions of how much brain it takes to be able to have consciousness, to be a mind, and how much brain it takes to change what that mind is. What is the relationship between the brain, the mind, and the self? And how much of that brain can or should I change if I'm looking to affect that mind and in some way perhaps affect that self? What does that mean, for example, for various interventions that are oriented towards treating conditions of chronic pain, of sadness, of fear, of various behaviors that we find to be individually or socially problematic? At what point do we change the brain to change the mind and change the self? And if, in fact, we can do this biomedically, oriented to those things that we use the tools of the brain sciences to define as conditions and diseases that need help, well, there's an interesting, curious circularity that exists there. We're using the knowledge and the tools we have about the brain to define what is normal or abnormal. 
functional or dysfunctional, able or disabled, right or wrong, good or bad, acceptable or unacceptable, permissible, not permissible. And in the extreme, not only how we regard these things and these individuals who have those characteristics and qualities of brain and its expression in their thoughts, feelings, and actions, but how we treat them. Neurocentric criteria of the regard and treatment of others, our own kind. Other species that we know have brains, and we're now becoming ever more aware that those brains are capable, if not <laughs> very, really probable, generating some kind of a mind. And then let's just take, if we will, a little jump. And once again, unless you've been living on another planet or unless you've been in one of those UAPs, those unexplained anomalous phenomena we see jetting across the sky, you have to recognize within the past couple of years, there's been some very ardent discussion and debate as to whether or not we've created consciousness in a machine system. Did somebody at Google create an artificial intelligence that wasn't just intelligent, but also sentient? Conscious? Well, the short answer to that question is no. But the question that it spawns is, could we? Back in 2014, our group wrote a paper and demonstrated both through engineering calculations as well as certain, certain philosophical ruminations on those calculations. The answer to that question is, yeah, it's just a matter of time. We may not even recognize that that thing has consciousness because that system may not communicate its consciousness to us, which is a problem that we face right now in the brain sciences, which is so much of the work of my esteemed colleague up in New York City, Dr. Joseph Finns. Joe Finns has written a wonderful book that I, I recommend to you called Rights Come to Mind. And Professor Finns works very, very closely with a number of international colleagues studying what he's referred to as, listen to it, covert consciousness. Well, the question I asked to my buddy Joe Finns is, hey, isn't some aspect of all of our consciousness covert? There are aspects of my consciousness that you can't know of because consciousness, per consciousness as it is, is always subjective. It's always intentional. It's always transparent just to me. Can we use the brain sciences to in some way objectively depict that that brain is making consciousness, therefore that that organism is conscious? Well, we're trying. We're trying. We're doing it by virtue of that pattern recognition and that large-scale repository that we may be able to develop through brain mapping, but we still haven't answered the question of how. Or perhaps have we, by creating something that's consciousness, creating a consciousness in a system, perhaps all we need to do then is ask that system how it is that it became conscious. But what if that system itself doesn't know, but certainly demonstrates that it is? Have we created a new life form? And how will we treat that life form? The way we treat other life forms? Do we use all of the knowledge we've gained from the neurosciences with regard to the way we sort of interact with others and treat others? Well, come on, our track record, the way we treat each other isn't exactly so great. And I can tell you up until quite recently, the way we regarded animals wasn't exactly cheeky. So what happens if we create something? More than that, what happens if that analogously neural system has operations that we can't know about because we can't access it and it's not gonna tell us. Now has the thing that we have neuroscientifically and neuroengineeringly created become the creator? Creating its own language, creating its own culture, creating its own norms? What will we do with that? Look, let's face it, in the few minutes we've had together just this far, one of the things that we've been able to explore over these past 25, 30 minutes, is the fact that the brain sciences are increasingly emboldened by the tools we have, inclusive of our own human tools of curiosity, inquiry, cooperation, collaboration, and even competition and conflict. How will the brain sciences figure into that calculus of our own behavior? 
Will the tools of the brain sciences be used just as a lens to peer into the brain so that perhaps we may better understand how it is that brain functions, nodes, networks, and structures are involved in these myriad cognitive and emotional states that underlie, underscore, in some ways compel and direct our behaviors? Perhaps, but I doubt it. Because again, we just don't turn over rocks to see what's underneath the rocks. We're tool users, inclusive of knowledge. We use knowledge for stuff. We do stuff with it. Brain science is an enterprise in the human domain of other enterprises. So the tools that we have for assessment very often are nothing more than the stepping stone upon which we will then build those tools to be able to affect the brain and its functions. And we're already there. We've gone from the rather crude to that which is almost incredible. The tools of the brain sciences can be parsed basically into those techniques and technologies that are used to assess the brain. You know, for example, uh, various forms of brain scanning and neuroimaging, which are somewhat contentious, but the basis of that contention has allowed for iterative improvement in both the design as well as implementation of those techniques where now we're really comfortable although there are still some problems with regard to comparing individual data to group data and group data to individual data and what that means for norms, but we're working on it. Combine those things with genetic data, and there are, as you may know, particular genes that seem to be involved with neurological structures and their psychosocial functions, what we call neuropsychogenes. And it's not just a question of using neuroimaging and or neurogenetics to depict what's going on in the brains, literally from the genes to the level of its structure, to the expression of its functions. But if I can drift into what appears to be bellicose or military terminology, but to target those things, targets, targets to affect those things, developing improved means and much more stereospific approaches to accessing the brain, not crudely, but ever more creatively not just highly invasively, but increasingly non-invasive, utilizing other forms of technology and engineering, such as nanoparticulate matter that we can then create into sensors and transmitters that can be inhaled, ingested, rubbed on, that can then be migrated into the brain to form vast arrays of sensors and transmitters to be able to read information from the living brain and write information into the living brain in real time remotely. This is a current project of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency here in the United States called NCUBED, Next Generation Non-Invasive Neuromodulation. But wait a minute, if what we're doing is literally, literally taking information data from the living brain, extracting it in real time, interpreting it, and in those interpretations, imbuing those data with meaning. That's a literal definition for reading. We're reading the functions of the brain, which we call mind. That's mind reading. How far should we go? How far should we not? What do we gain if we go? What do we gain if we don't? What might be the benefits, burdens, the risks, the harms of doing that or not doing that? But wait, there's more. It's not just a question of reading, it's a question of writing. And in a lot of ways, it's also a question of arithmetic. Reading, writing, and quote, arithmetic. An old song from my youth that I now pass on legacy to you. Well, the writing part goes now that we can transmit into the living brain remotely through the crowd. If in fact we're using the cloud that way, now we're harnessing, if you will, the cybersphere to be able to access the cerebrosphere of individuals, of groups, of collectives, of our whole population, of our species, and perhaps of other species too. And in that way, we may be able to facilitate different ways of communicating, different ways of relating with each other, or machines, with other species perhaps, a unifying vision. Or a controlling vision. Because if, in fact, that same technology that allows us to literally read the mind 
by scanning and interpreting the data we get from the structures and functions of the brain. And the inverse of that is that we can then write into the living brain that's mind control. And what will we do with that capability? Where will those data go? Who will own them? How will we protect them? What will they be used for? By whom? In what ways? We love to think that one of the things that we always do with these types of data are aim them towards the good. Oh, absolutely. We develop what we know. In other words, we, we engage our fancy word, epistemology, what we know and how we know it. And we put it to use in the anthropological domain. Human endeavor for human endeavor. Well, what do we do in our human endeavors? Well, we're striving to do good things, aren't we? We're striving to perhaps lessen the burden of disease and injury, or perhaps even the burdens that occur as a consequence of our living our lives from the womb to the tomb. To alleviate the human predicament of injury, pain, suffering, disease and its manifest illnesses in their subjective experience and perhaps extend our lives in ways that are not just quantitatively extended to live ever longer, but to live more fully ever longer and longer and longer. And there are those who think that there are contemporary techniques and toolkits in the brain sciences that will allow the preservation of brain functions in an ever restorable and replaceable parted body Bring our lifespans and our brain spans, new word. Well, into the hundreds, 100 plus, 110, 115. Many programs that arose, for example, out of the United States Brain Research to Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies Initiative, the Brain Initiative, were geared exactly to doing that. Can we keep brain function at its optimum? Sustaining it, even though the individual body in which that may occur may be suffering the ravages of disease and injury. Can we repair the broken brain? Can we sustain, if you will, the stuff of our sentience, the greatness of those gray cells that soup and spark in our, in our heads? And what does that then mean for individuals, for groups, for our jobs, for our societies? There's a colleague we have, uh, an international colleague in Italy. His name is Professor Sergio Canovero. He is an Italian neurosurgeon. And Professor Canovero has proposed something. He has proposed to build upon some of the existing prior work of a physician scientist named Dr. Robert White here in the United States, who initially offered the idea that, well, you know, if we could keep the brain going, and if the brain is the seat of the structure that provides at least the functions that then are the running wetware program of our minds, and our minds are part of our identity and are therefore definable self, could we not extend selves ever longer by either repairing a brain or certainly by repairing the body that that brain is in, keeping that brain going? But do we really need that? body to do that? White originally proposed and Cano Vero has picked up the baton of a very, very controversial neuroscientific and neurological procedure called Heaven Gemini. And it's an acronym for the actual name and, and aspects of the procedure, which in, in simple reduction is the first proposed human body to head transplant. Canavero begs the question, does a brain really need a body? Or does that brain just need to develop its consciousness and feel that it is embodied? And through some form of embodiment, whether a transplanted body or some type of brain computational, artificial reality, virtual reality interface, therefore become embedded in the world. Now, before you think that's completely crazy, let me ask each and all of you a question. Do you really think you need your body? No, oh, yeah, but you think to yourself, that's how I experience the world, absolutely. And you're right, it's called embodied consciousness. But do you really need that body? What if 
We could give you a new one if that one was, heaven forbid, a gazillion times damaged irreparably, degenerating irreparably and irretrievably. We just got old. Do you really need a physical body? Think for a moment about virtual and artificial reality systems, how good they've become and what they feel like when you put those goggles on. And what an experience that is. What if we could now literally hardwire virtual reality and artificial reality into the very workings, the structural machinations of your brain? Your reality is what your brain perceives it to be. I'm going to prove it to you. How many of you dream? It's not a rhetorical question. You need to ask yourselves, how many of you dream? The reality of the question is we all do. We just don't all remember it. But here's one for you. When you're dreaming, do you know you're dreaming? Well, some of you may be talented enough, skilled enough to lucidly dream. That's great. Great technique. Can't do it all the time. Here's one for you. How do you know you're not dreaming now? See my point? Your reality is what your brain makes of its inputs of sense data. And if, in fact, what we can do is in some way yoke brains and machines in such a configuration, it may very well be that we can keep brains, heads, going for a long time with artificial bodies that then yoke humans ever more to machine systems and blur the line between what is cyber and what is cerebral, what is mankind, what is machine, what is self, what is sentience, and what is system. None of this is neuroscience fiction. It's all quite real. So when I tell you that the brain science is becoming ever more bold, they are. And more than that, they're becoming ever more international. And understand, the conduct of science is very often predicated and reflects whatever culture that science is being conducted. Cultures differ. Their history is different. Their needs, their values, their philosophies, their ethics. And that also allows for different permissivities and constraints about what research gets done, how it gets done, and how the products of that research are then offered as marketable tools in medicine, lifestyle, even in the military. And again, one of the things we'd like to think is we're going to use these things for good. But here's a question for you. Who's good? How do we define that good? My definition of good may not be the same as your definition of good. And even what we may consider to be the most capricious, if not nefarious applications of brain science, dual use, the use of brain science to develop weapons or to create super soldiers. Come on, folks. Show me a country or a group or a collective that goes off to battle thinking that they're the bad guys. They do it for what they define to be good. They do it to defend what they hold to be right and good in their culture, in their nation, in their values, in their history, in their ideals. Good for their kin, their kith, their way of life. Defending against those things that are perceived as threats with various levels of dread, real or imagined. How do we define what the goods are of brain science and how we should do that research and how we should engage that research in various applications, medically, lifestyle, politically, economically, militarily? Well, one possibility is to look into the brain. Might it be that there's something of a, a meta construct here? Could we perhaps use the brain sciences to study the way brains develop moral cognition develop systems of ethics and laws and how a brain responds to what individuals and groups hold or regard to be right, wrong, good, bad? Yeah, perhaps. The neuroscience of morality, the neuroscience of ethics. Whoa. Neuroethics. Yeah. One domain of neuroethics is engaging neuroscience to try to figure out how it is that humans and perhaps other species and maybe even perhaps machines do ethics. How is it that we cognitively weigh what we ultimately adjudicate to be right or wrong or good or bad, norm or abnormal, functional, dysfunction, acceptable, not acceptable, fearful, friendly, foe? We might. We might. 
And there are a number of studies that are directly addressing those ways that brains engage in those cognitive processes of philosophical, moral, ethical, and even legal reasoning, adjudication, and action. But here's where it all comes together. If I'm going to do the neuroscience of anything, I don't care if it's a neuroscience of pantomime and modern dance, if I'm going to use the brain sciences to study the way we and other species, perhaps, and even machines do that thing, well, then we need to use ethics in the way we conduct the research, interpret the research, and use that research in its myriad applications in the human condition and endeavor. So neuroethics is not just the neurological studies of moral cognition, emotions, and actions that are then entailed and obtained by ethics. It's the moral and ethical basis, justifications, issues, questions, and problems that are generated in and by neuroscientific research and its varied uses and applications in the social sphere. Neuroethics. Our group has said that Neuroethics is something of a meta construct. And in some ways it is, right? I mean, we can study the neuroscience of the way we do morality, ethics, and law, but we must also then apply and be studious of the morality, ethics, and laws that we use to generate neuroscientific research, conduct the research, disseminate the research, and put that research to use. Neuroethics. Our group has advocated no new neuroscience without neuroethics. And optimistically, I can tell you that that's gained some traction in international communities because the field of neuroethics is blossoming. It's about 20 years old and it's becoming a field unto its own. It's sort of reaching maturity and sort of facing its future, facing its future in a self-critical and self-revisionist way. It too is becoming a lens to look at the brain sciences and turning that around as a mirror to look back upon itself in a corrective way, a guiding way, a directive, and perhaps even governing way. And that's important. But we've also called for no neuroethics without neuroscience. Look, we, we don't need to sit around and twiddle our thumbs and look at the lint in our navel under some tree on a happy afternoon and make things up. Look, I love science fiction and I love neuroscience fiction. Some of it is quite good. But there are plenty of things in this bold new neuroscience that require brave new neuroethical address, engagement, revision, and development. And that's what you're going to do. That's why I'm talking to you. As students and participants in the international brain B, that's exactly what you're doing. It's axiomatic to your participation in this process. You're international. You're bringing to the fore your various cultures, your histories, your families, your values, your educational system, your interests, your passions, your hopes and your fears. Focusing on the brain sciences and recognizing that the brain sciences hold a key as well as a lock, a key to what makes us us. But also there's a lock there that we need to essentially trip those little tumblers and open to make sure that we keep that door open or closed in the right ways. That's why you're here. I'm confident. No, I'm confident, number one, that we've embraced the idea of no new neuroscience without neuroethics. And I'm optimistic in that, well, we're sort of approaching no neuroethics without realistic appraisal and engagement of the brain sciences. In other words, not fictional approaches to ethics, but dealing with real problems in real time, in real ways, in multicultural and cosmopolitan vistas of capability and application. But what makes me really, really optimistic, and I, I think what makes me confident most, is the passing of the torch from my generation to yours. Look, folks, I'm 65 years old. I've been at this for four decades, and it's been great. There's not a day that's gone to work where I haven't loved the work. I haven't learned something new, haven't taught something new, haven't put a light on over someone's head, haven't gained information, insight from the students I teach and watch my students become professors, professionals on their own, not just in the brain sciences, but in a variety of different career paths that intersect with and support the brain sciences and society and culture and the arts and education and law. It's a baton I pass to you. And passing that baton to you, what I'll tell you is that this really becomes a toolkit for you. Because in your careers, in your lifespans, in your professional, your personal lives, what you'll see is the realization of neuroscientific tools at a very rapid pace across a broad scale of capability that allow ever more 
to be done, to assess, to access, and to affect the brain. And you know, what, what ends up happening there is that with that increasing knowledge, with those ever expanding tasks that we assume, that we assign ourselves, that we become curious about, we develop new tools. And with increasing knowledge and tools comes great power. With great power comes great responsibility. No new neuroscience without neuroethics. No new neuroethics without neuroscience. And realistically, that has to get out there into the broader milieu of the public sphere, multiculturally, and that's up to you. So I'll leave you with something. I'll leave you with a bit of a legacy quote from my dad that he told me when I was just a kid that I'll pass on to you. And there's a bit of my dad's wisdom. I'll weave a story for you in a few minutes that sort of gives you some insight to how that came about. My dad was an engineer. He was a nautical engineer. And he worked on ships. He designed submarines. But what he, he really loved to do in his spare time was build stuff. He was an inveterate tinkerer. And he had a great workshop down in our basement. And my dad was a good teacher as well. And one of the things he taught me to do is use tools. And he started this when I was just a little kid. You know, I was about six years old and I'd watch him build stuff and repair stuff. And I thought, wow, that was the coolest thing. That was just slickered and snot. And my dad thought, wow, this is a good father-son exercise. And that's what we did. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time working down in the workshop, building stuff, fixing stuff, repairing stuff, tinkering. And one of the things my dad did is he would bring home a new tool every month. And then we'd spend that month using that tool together with the other tools, basically learning and doing, learning and doing. He did it the first Tuesday of every month. It was called New Tool Tuesday. Well, he started this, like I said, when I was about six. And, and I remember I was about 12. Now, do some simple math here. Started at six, new tool every month. So we're talking, what, 12 tools a year. I've been doing it for six years. That's better than 70 tools. That's a pretty good toolkit. Plus, I was now 12 years old, and uh, you know how you are when you're 12. You're a little cocky, you think you know stuff. You don't necessarily know what you don't know. And it was New Tool Tuesday. I was working on something down on the workbench. My dad came home from work, and I was really excited because he was going to bring me a new tool. And I was like, thanks, Dad. Got the new tool. Took the new tool in my hand. I was about to go run it off down to the workbench. And I remember my dad grabbed me by the scruff of the neck like a puppy. And he said, hey, Jim, slow down. But this one we need to measure twice before we make any cuts because we won't be able to take it back. <sighs> that stuck with me all these years. Because what you will encounter, my wonderful scholars, my next generation of brain scientists, is that the brain sciences will provide for you a new tool Tuesday, not every month but almost every week that you will encounter, that you will learn with, you will learn from, what will you do with those tools? How will you use those tools? You'll need to measure twice before you make the cut as to what you use and what you don't and why and how you use it. Because that toolkit of neuroscience comes with the responsibility for neuroethics and that responsibility is yours. I hope I haven't bored you for the past hour. I hope you found our little discussion here to be at least informative, if not interesting, and maybe a little entertaining too. And I thank you so very, very much for three things. Number one, for your time and patience, consideration and interest in my work. Number two, for your interest in the brain sciences. And for number three, for giving me hope that the future of the brain sciences, not our society that rests upon the brain sciences, is incapable in good hands. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Jim. That was uh, really great. Um, uh, if the students have any questions for you, maybe we can open it to an, uh, to an open discussion. Absolutely. I'd love to do this. I, I, I can spend as, as long as 30 additional minutes answering questions if you'd like. OK, so let's see if our participants have any questions. Yes, please. I have a question. Sure. Um, when you were talking about what if your body it's not really necessary about your brain. Please, you mentioned a certain term. Can you repeat it? I think heaven, Gemini, or something yeah, like that. The, the actual procedure is called heaven, 
Gemini, where, where that stands for a head, arteriovenous anastomosis, Gemini, and Gemini refers to the twinning of a body donor with a head recipient. And that, that, particular, that particular procedure was named Heaven Gemini by Dr. Sergio Canavero of Italy, who is proposing to actually be the first to conduct that procedure. And he's working with some colleagues at the University of Harbin Medical College in China to be able to advance that to the next step into human trials. Okay, um, so does having Gemini remove just the brain or it comes with the whole nope. head of... Yeah, so what happens is it actually severs the, the head at the level of the mid-neck, and then it's at this level that they transplant the donor body. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Other questions? I would like to uh, ask a question if you... Sure. Yeah, do you think personally that someday, maybe a hundred years from now, maybe a thousand years from now, that we will get a biological uh, definition of what conscious is? Do you think conscious is something that... No. Um, we... No, I, I, I don't think it will be 100 years or 1,000 years from now. I think it would be within the next decade or two, much, much more recently than 100 to 1,000 years from now. Yeah, like, do you think that conscious ha has a biological definition? I think it has a partial biological basis, but what that biological basis is may be predicated upon certain aspects of physics as well, which then begs the question of whether the brain is a box that has to assume a particular structure to trap this thing that becomes or is consciousness. Whether the brain is an antenna that must also assume some developed structure to be able to then capture the thing, but as an antenna rather than just a receptacle. Or if the brain is a generator that must also achieve some structure to be able to have the parts necessary to create this thing called consciousness. Or if it's some combination of all three of those entities at various times during our development, we're all at the same time for different aspects of consciousness. And if in fact consciousness then represents a physical force in the universe and what that physical force is and how that force would then need to literally be engaged within a structure to be able to elicit that subjective experience of the force itself. So I think that there's an interesting admixture right now of advanced integrative scientific convergence inclusive of the neurosciences and physics that allows us to gain a, get a better appreciation of the relationality between the physical sciences, the natural and the life sciences that may be important to develop such an understanding, if not definition of what consciousness might be. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Happy to answer your question. I, I have, have a question. Okay. Just a second. Let, let me just moderate a bit. So because we had um, Rin Jung from Vietnam also had his hand up. Okay, I'll let her. Okay. Um. So I have a question. Okay. Consciousness is by if consciousness is biologically defined within a certain period of time, like you say, what do you think will be the sociological impact of that? Because as you know, people have religions and stuff. If all of that can be explained by science or partially science, then what do you think it will change? I don't know that anything needs to necessarily change. I think it might allow a, a broader appreciation of what humans have in common and what humans may have in difference. And it may also allow some appreciation of the fact that other organisms may also entertain some type of consciousness that may not be identical to our own, but would still be viable as consciousness per se within the parameters of its or their physical structures. It needn't necessarily change anything as regards to particular religions, but it would allow some reinterpretation of religious information based upon various religious traditions. It wouldn't necessarily dispel the idea of the transcendent, what caused consciousness initially, what consciousness becomes initially. Those are temporal as well as spatially transcendent questions that we could then continue to ponder. And we could then frame those in various religious traditions, doctrinally rather than dogmatically, so I think it would be interesting. I think socially, one of the things it could do is could certainly add some depth and dimensionality to a we regard and treat other things that we now may understand to at least be possibly conscious, if not 
probably and definitively conscious. And that, in fact, may then feed back into some of our behaviors on a variety of scales from the individual to the international. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have a question from Jibyan. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you said uh, neuroethics has to be used to develop for neuroscience further. And uh, the more we develop neuroscience, the more we can develop neuroethics. Mm -hmm. And you, you said uh, measure it twice before make any cuts. Mm -hmm. However, the ruler with which we measure had to be cut before it could be used i so, disagree i wholly disagree with that i think that the idea here is to develop an iterative ruler as we go because the capability we have to define the metrics and the extent of the rule of the ruler is what defines the size of the ruler we use so it becomes what's called an autopoietic enterprise So uh, then, uh, what was the first uh, version of uh, neuroethics? When was the first it? Version uh, was the the, the neuroscience, the neuroscientific study of those processes that are important to a, an organism's moral cognitions, emotions, and actions, and how those moral cognitions, emotions, and actions are contributory to that organism's or that collective organism's generation of ethical systems, constructs, et cetera, that may then feed into larger collective constructs of what may then be law. And uh, when were these studies conducted? Oh, they're, it's, they're ongoing. In the field of neuroethics, I think the term itself was first introduced in the late 1980s in a, in a very narrow, narrow sense expanded into the late 1990s, but really became, I, I think, a, a prevalent intellectual, academic, and then social construct in 2002, when the late William Sapphire, a, a journalist of the New York Times, used the term and defined it operationally at a Dana Foundation conference in California. It, it literally caught on like, like wildfire, not only within academia and scholarly communities, but also more broadly within the public domain. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, I think uh, the first person was Sophie. You had a question? You had your hand up. And then before I saw that you wanted to ask a question, do you still want to do it? Yeah, of course. Um, well, hi, thank you. First of hi, all. Sophie, how are you? Hi, thank you. I'm doing good. What about you? Great. That's good. Um, throughout your whole uh, talk, I kept on thinking about um, this thing that was taught to us. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, brain in a vat or brain in a bucket theory. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, regarding that, how can your ethics help, to help us navigate the ethical implications of potentially living in a simulated reality? Wow, that's one of those questions that's going to take a long time to answer, but I'll give you the, I'll give you the, the, the quick answer. Mm -hmm. One of the things that becomes important is to understand what would be needs, values, and um, constraints, both right. individually for that brain to experience its reality, and then how that brain would interact with other brains within the construct of a formative system. Right. So being able to parameterize what would then be viewed as valuable, both individually as well as communally, is an inherent set of ethical maxims that would need to be considered if indeed we're going to move ahead to create some type of brain in a vat or right. systemic cerebral construct. And there are some good discussions that are actually going on in, in that regard. So I'm I'm optimistic about the need to develop those types of discourses and do them as a dialectical. In other words, there's not necessarily a single right answer, mm -hmm. but they need to be approached in a way that is synthetic yeah. and perhaps also in a way that brings together certain belief systems, which is then a syncretic ethical approach. And yeah. that's some of the work my group is doing, for example, uh, right now. Uh, if you read some of the work I've done with my colleague, Professor John Shook, um, you see there's, we talk about as a cosmopolitan neuroethical approach that we hope to be as synthetic as conceivably possible in acknowledgement of 
a variety of different individuals and collective values, needs, et cetera. Thank you. <laughs> oh, very very well. like great, great question. Okay, thank you very much. Should we go on with Stephanie? I think you're muted, Stephanie. Yes, so um, my I have two questions. And my first question is, how is all this work, um, how is all this work being introduced in Africa? Because personally, I don't really hear much about such stuff. And until I joined this program, I didn't really know a lot of stuff and a whole lot. So how is, um, how, what measures are put in place so that Africa and other deprived continents, if there yeah. are any, catch up? Well, that, that's, that's a great question. So again, it, it goes back to our view about a cosmopolitan view of both neuroscience and neuroethics, because one of the things we understand is that so much of the brain sciences represent the province and the conduct and therefore the custodianship of developed countries. Right? Um, that then creates asymmetrical capability, not only within those developed countries and between those developed countries, but among developed countries, developing countries, and non-developed countries. And those asymmetries are not only asymmetries in knowledge and research and capability, but also with regard to those capabilities and what they incur for individuals, groups of individuals, as relates to the way those individuals are regarded or treated. And that then incurs particular power dynamics. So we are very, very concerned about the need to have multicultural, multinational neuroscientific and neuroethical approaches and programs that appreciate different cultures, various needs, values, philosophies, applications, and approaches, and do so in a way that is dialectical and discursive. Thank you. Um, so my second question, how can neuroethics be applied in computational neuroscience where we are not really trying to explore the mind but are trying to do something more of like machine learning and stuff like that oh yeah i mean so so very simply the idea is can we create machine learning paradigms and systems that has mm -hmm. some form of doctrinal approach to a moral cognate that is viable not only for the system but for the system's engagement with are going to be its share and stakeholders which would be humans and then what is required to do that? Humans in the loop, humans on the loop, humans out of the loop that then regard the machine to be able to create its own potential system of morality without human corruption, and mm -hmm. perhaps regard humans as an entirety of a civilization rather than within the constraints of what may be cultural and naturalistic or nationalistic interests. So a lot of the issues of neuroethics are applicable to cyber ethics as well. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I think Cornelia is now. Hello. Thank you for your talk. I have a question because now yeah. I heard that um, like organoids of a brain are developed, and I was yeah. thinking if we can uh, if we can define consciousness in like a biological way, then yeah. uh, such an, do you think that such an organoid of a brain can uh, gain consciousness? What do you think about that? Do I think that an organoid could gain consciousness? I mean, yeah, because there, I uh, I was talking like a researcher, and then yeah. they had a like growing brain, which was yeah. That. So, so uh, there's a couple there's a couple of constraints on cerebral organoids. Yeah. The first constraint is: does the organoid possess some neurological mechanism to be able to access a sensorium? In other words, does it have sense neurons? Can it sense its environment? The short answer is right now, no. So it's an internal environment only. So it can only basically engage its internality. It may be able to develop some rudimentary self of where that internality ends, but there's nothing inherently to that organoid, organoid that allows it to sense the outside world, so to speak. It can't see, it can't hear, it can't feel, or can it? The question then becomes, is there something intrinsic to nerve cells working together with glial cells in a node and network hierarchy in such a way that then allows it the autonomous development of what might be epi what's called epiphenomenal sensation. And we don't know. So I think organoids provide us with a very interesting challenge and opportunity. We may be creating something that gives us insight to the way 
nerve cells and glial cells, quote, experience and engage their environment on a variety of scales from the very, very small to the rather macro scale. And then at the same time, we have to appreciate what that environment and that thing that is the organoid has then become. And if that level of neurological activity is sufficient enough to generate even something that is proto-conscious, how should we regard the organoid? Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so Prashukta, I think, was now uh, coming to her question. No, sir. Sir, um, we don't, like, when we're sleeping, we don't always dream. And like you said, that when we dream, we don't know that we're dreaming. So is dreaming considered a conscious experience? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's multi-dimensions to consciousness. We have what's called our waking consciousness or our apparent consciousness, sometimes referred to as our fluent consciousness. We have those things that we're not necessarily aware of. So in other words, the actual act of our consciousness is a function of brain activities that occur hierarchically. So that's, that's consciousness. And there are consciousness things that we are aware of, working consciousness. Things that exist right below that are called our pre-conscious state. We can bring them up into our consciousness. We have our subconscious, which are things that we were aware of, but are not in intimately aware of on a regular basis, but in fact could influence both our pre and waking consciousness. And we have those functions and operations of the nervous system that are unconscious, that we're not necessarily aware of, but that can influence both our sub pre and waking consciousness hierarchically. And we need to consider, sort of consider consciousness kind of like the iceberg phenomenon, right? That there's a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface of the water. It's still all ice, part of the iceberg, and the shape of the iceberg changes as a consequence of the dimensionality and dynamics of what exists below the waterline or what exists above. That said, I mean, I think it becomes important to understand that actually everybody does dream. We do all dream. It's just a question of whether or not your particular sleep architecture, in other words, how you go through your dream cycles, is such to enable you to recall your dreams with sufficient lucidity and, and validity when you wake up vividly enough to be able to make some sense of the dream itself. Thank you, sir. Sure. Okay, Ciprian. Okay, I have another question. Sure. Um, you said um, the brain could be a uh, quantum computer. No, or... no, 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 no. I said the brain can. The brain could engage quantum-like computational functions much like a quantum computer. Okay, I understand. Then uh, what is, uh, I'm just curious, what is your personal opinion on the role of microtubules in uh, consciousness? Oh, that's the Penrose hammer off idea. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that you know, they, they were sort of looking for a putative structure, some structure that could sustain some form of quantized operation within a classical mechanical milieu. And the one that became most apparent to them were microtubules and microfilaments. I, I think it's not necessarily a question of the structure itself or the structure per se, but rather um, the scale at which we're looking at to be able to determine if and to what extent quantized operations may in fact be sustainable and at what level they're then translatable into some form of mechanical classical operation set whereby certain aspects of quantum operations are preserved on a larger scale so i don't necessarily think it's a question of pointing to a particular structure but rather uh viewing the scalar dimensionality of the system as the necessary hierarchy in which those various types of operations can be manifest, sustained, and engaged. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I have to run off and run across campus to another lecture that begins at 2.30. And so I'm going to have to bid each and all of you, at least for now, a very fond farewell. Again, I thank you so very, very much for entertaining your interest in the brain sciences and entertaining my participation with you here today. And I do hope that you found what I told you to be interesting maybe provocative, which is cool, informative for sure, and maybe a little entertaining too, if for no other reason that it stimulates your thought in key ways that maybe you weren't thinking about the way things think like this before. And that's a good thing, okay?
So we must thank Professor Giordano for his amazing lecture. Please, let's give him a round of applause. Oh, that's very kind of Virtual thank applause. You. Thank you very much. Quite kind. Thank you. Thank you much. And uh, thank you all for your participation. I would just like to remind you that um, we will continue today's schedule with um, uh, with a, a video that you're going to be watching. So in your schedule, you should be able to see uh, the cultural exchange video by just clicking the link uh, in the schedule. So please go after this lecture to your schedule, click on the link and to watch the video. Uh, we can say that it's something to look forward for. Thank, thank you very you much, Professor Giordano. Bye -bye. Thank you all.